couldn't set that up while Daniel was singing. <laughs> wow. Several years ago, my friend and colleague, the fantastic Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Kendall Gibbons, created a list of what she called the 12 characteristics of spiritual maturity. The 12 characteristics of spiritual maturity. Isn't that interesting? And one of the 12 characteristics was this. According to Reverend Gibbons, spiritually mature people are attracted to justice, mercy, and beauty. According to Reverend Gibbons, spiritually mature people are attracted to justice, to mercy, and to beauty. It seems to me that Unitarian Universalism, on the whole, does a pretty good job of being attracted to justice. That's something that our faith tradition seems to do really well at. Justice is something we emphasize and celebrate. In terms of mercy, I think this faith tradition has a lot going for it in that area as well. Mercy, I believe, is honored within our tradition. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not claiming perfection or enlightenment, but it does seem to me that on the whole, Unitarian Universalism does place a strong emphasis on justice and does emphasize mercy. But this morning, I, what I'd like to do is to consider the third part of one of those 12 characteristics of spiritual maturity. I want to talk about beauty and attraction to beauty. I want to talk about the connection between beauty and religion, generally, but also specific to Unitarian Universalism. And maybe, depending on how the sermon goes, I will talk about my brief career as a model. <laughs> You learn something about me every Sunday, don't you? <laughs> All across different religions, different cultures, throughout recorded history, the practice of religion and the creation of artistic beauty have been intertwined. Go to the North Carolina Museum of Art and you'll find statues of the gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome. You'll find century after century of European paintings, of scenes from the Bible, the lives of saints, the Madonna and child. You'll find, as I found the last time I went, an entire room of Judaica with ornate coverings for Torah scrolls, just these unbelievably beautiful Seder plates and menorahs. Other museums you may have visited feature the ornate geometric patterns of Islam, <coughs> the lovely statues of religious figures from Asia, Buddha, Krishna, Kali, Kuan Yin, and so many more. <coughs> and you can't really talk about the connection between beauty and religion without mentioning the world of beautiful religious music, from the singing of the Jewish cantor and the Islamic call to prayer to Bach, Amazing grace, gospel, so much more. So what about Unitarian Universalism? Where does Unitarian Universalism find beauty? As I've traveled the country to different UU churches all around the country, one of the things that I noticed most about what we choose to include in our sanctuaries, this is across new churches, is that most of our sanctuaries, many of our sanctuaries, include <coughs> windows, transparent, translucent windows that look out at the natural world. When this building was being renovated 13 years ago, the biggest change that was made was the moving from a completely dark room with no natural light, to one with these clear stories looking out at trees, and these large windows here. I want to point out 
that this is an aesthetic choice as well as a theological choice. We tend to find beauty in the natural world, and you are encouraged to look out at that world. I am not the focus. You know, sometimes I like to pretend that I am, but really, I am not the focus. The symbol is not really the focus. The piano is the focus. Glenn usually sits here, but he's not sitting here in the service. Glenn's not the focus. This is, in the field of vision, what is center and largest. And I do want to make a very interesting observation. Generally speaking, religious traditions that are more orthodox, more conservative, more literalist, more fundamentalist, tend to construct worship spaces with little to no natural light and without windows permitting us to look out at the world. And, generally speaking, religious traditions that are more heterodox, more liberal, more metaphorical, more progressive, tend to build worship spaces with lots of natural light and lots of windows. If you went to all of the religious communities in Chapel Hill, and you put them on a spectrum from windows to no windows, <laughs> and you put them on a spectrum from more conservative or more literalist to more liberal, it would look exactly the same. Isn't that interesting? Who thinks that? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> As a congregation, we also find beauty in the visual arts. I think it's worth noting that we display the work of professional artists 10 months out of the year. In November, which it is right now, we display at each November an art project created by the children of our church, um, which is always lovely. And then in December, we have the greeting for the holidays. I find it fascinating to observe folks in this congregation interact with the art frequently. I see people walk around and gaze at the art con contemplatively before the service. And I think that experiencing this sort of changing and rotating exhibition of artistic vision is also in line with our theology. We are the church that finds beauty through windows that look out into the world, and we are the church that encounters beauty by considering a diversity of artistic visions. I want to talk about two areas in which religion and beauty overlap. They overlap, it seems to me, one area they overlap is when it comes to transcendence. Both beauty and religion somehow emphasize transcendence. It's hard to put it fully into words, but have you ever had an experience of beauty that included this feeling of being kind of lifted out of the world in which you are into some other plane of existence. Is that, a, is that a feeling? I want to describe one such experience I've had. You've had, you've had your own. I remember once attending a worship service at a charismatic, non-denominational church located in an extremely poor urban neighborhood. This is a building that was extremely run down. The sanctuary of the church had all of the architectural charm of a middle school cafeteria. <laughs> and I, I'm describing this to set the scene because the worship service included the church's praise dancers, mostly middle school and high school students, a group of young people who put a CD on the boombox of, of praise music and did a choreographed dance. And it was clear that what they were doing was this sort of fully embodied dance of praise to God. And that somehow in this act of moving as beautifully as they could, the walls and the hard seats of the room sort of melted away and 
what, what I experienced was this sense of lifting up out of, out of the world where it was for a time. And I believe that they, as they danced, experienced that as well. And it was beautiful. And you probably have your own experience of transcendence. And there's a related, somewhat similar way in which religion and beauty are linked. Philosophers, it turns out, who write about beauty comment on how beauty has the effect of taking us out of ourselves. Elaine Scarry writes, at the moment we see something beautiful, we undergo a radical decentering. Simone Weil, the French mystic, philosopher, and anti-fascist activist, Simone Weil writes, Beauty requires us to give up our imaginary position at the center. A transformation then takes place at the very roots of our sensibility. And philosopher Iris Murdoch writes, anything which alters consciousness in the direction of unselfishness is to be connected with virtue. The most obvious thing in our surroundings, which is an occasion for unselfish, is what is popularly called beauty. The most obvious thing in our surroundings, which is an occasion for unselfing, is what is popularly called beauty. And that makes sense. What these philosophers all seem to be writing about is that the experience of encountering beauty involves somehow a challenge to our ego. I remember something that a favorite, a favorite author of mine, David Foster Wallace, once wrote. He, he wrote, everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> the realest, most vivid, and important person in existence. And I would say everything in my own immediate experience, except for, except for beauty. What these three philosophers who consider beauty seem to be saying is that beauty challenges the idea that you're the center of the universe by putting us in relationship to something beautiful, which somehow decenters us, unselfs us. And religion seems to do this as well at times. Religion, if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, can be a powerful challenge to narcissism, self-centeredness. As someone I know once, once said, for me, spiritual growth did not mean learning to believe in God. For me, spiritual growth meant ceasing to believe that I was God. <laughs> and I wonder, have you ever encountered, has there ever encountered beauty in a way that was decentering, unselfish? in somewhat of a, a different direction now and consider some of the, fact of the challenges and criticisms and concerns that are leveled against considerations of beauty. Kendall Gibbons, remember, writes that a characteristic of spiritual maturity is being attracted to justice, attracted to mercy, and attracted to beauty. And we might ask, are those three things alike? Are they of the same? Are they equally important? Is saying I'm attracted to justice and I'm committed to creating more justice, or saying I'm attracted to mercy and I'm committed to creating more just, more mercy, sort of the same on a value level as saying I'm attracted to beauty and committed to creating it? I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it's an important question to pose as philosophers have through the ages. Leo Tolstoy wrote an entire book weighing ethics against aesthetics, the good and the beautiful. Tolstoy comes at the end of his the book is called What is Art? And I'll give you a spoiler alert. 
he actually comes down on the side of the ethical. He argues that art exists for the purpose of inspiring emotions that generate ethical conduct. And to the extent that any art does not inspire emotions that lead to ethical conduct, it should not be considered art. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with him, but that's a provocative statement. But there are other criticisms of beauty as well. The biggest challenge when we talk about beauty is not <coughs> the beauty of an idea of God, the beauty of a piece of painting, the beauty of a sculpture, the beauty of nature. The biggest challenge seems to me to be how do we talk about human beauty? If spiritual maturity means that we are attracted to beauty, beauty in nature, beauty in art, beautiful ideas, does it follow that attraction to visually attractive people is a sign of spiritual maturity? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I say that in you know, such a way that you generate a laugh, but, but philosophers have actually been, been confounded by this problem. Because, let's face it, there is a real and present lookism, if I can coin a phrase, that is present in human society, in which those who happen to come closest to these societal ideals of human beauty are often worshipped and held to be good. And those who find themselves far away from societal standards of beauty are often treated as less than human on account of size or body type, health condition, or whatever. Think of the movie The Elephant Man. I suppose at this point that I should tell you about my modeling career. <laughs> It's 
kindergarten teachers of America. I did a good bit of reading in philosophy of the sermon this morning, and quite frankly, I see no way to resolve this beauty conundrum. On one hand, there are those who praise beauty and talk about the power of beauty and relate beauty to goodness and say that attraction to beauty is a sign of spiritual maturity. And we can all testify of having powerful experiences of beauty in which we're inspired and experience transcendence and are decentered and unselfed. And we want to praise those who like Daniel and Debbie and Glenn share their gifts of beauty with the world. And then on the other hand, when the category of beauty of aesthetics is extended to human bodies, these judgments about beauty become problematic, unhelpful, and damaging. And I see no way to resolve that struggle, it just is. I can leave you with this thought. Elaine Scarry wrote a beautiful book in defense of beauty entitled On Beauty and Being Just. Isn't that a great title? On Beauty and Being Just. In it, she makes a case for beauty. I enjoyed the book. And here's the thought that she was with. She says, there's an old-fashioned word for attractiveness, in the old-fashioned, that's called being fair. Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And that word comes from the same root, it's the same word as the word for fair as in state fair, and it's the same as this idea of Fairness. In fact, a fair is called a fair because it was a place of dealing where there would be standards in measurement and dealing would be fair. Fair is called a fair because of fairness and symmetry. And then, philosophers as far back as Socrates and Plato have spoken about beauty and said that beauty is symmetry. As in, evenness is in the scales of justice. And it seems to me that if there's a kind of beauty worth being attracted to, it would be this sense of beauty as fairness, as in the beauty of a world marked by fairness, a world in which beauty and justice and mercy are linked. Owen <coughs> Scary ends her book with a thought exercise. She asks, of our world to imagine a world a hundred years hence and to imagine that a hundred years hence people look back at us and they could describe us in, in, one of, in one of two ways. Either that was a people who appreciated beauty or it was a world in which people did not appreciate beauty. And she said that everyone, everyone would actually choose to be remembered, would want to be remembered as, as having a sense and a reverence for beauty. So that is the kind of beauty worth being attracted to, a world marked by fairness, a world in which beauty and mercy and justice are linked. And it's in that spirit that I've chosen our closing hymn for the morning. I thought about the fair and about those streamers and bandanas, and I thought, let's sing De Caloris. And so we're going, to sing, we're going to sing all four verses. We're going to sing the first three in English and that final verse in Spanish. So once we get the rhythm going, then we'll, then we'll really knock it out with our, with our best Spanish. And then we invite you to rise in body or spirit and sing this song that I think is a song about beauty.